Today we're going to be looking at another one of Veritasium's videos. Specifically, why is 37 everywhere? Some weird number stuff comes up every now and then in nuclear engineering. Though I'm not sure if we're de if he's talking about more esoteric woo-woo stuff like divine numbers or anything like that. <laughs> Let's see. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fultz. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. Let me show you something unbelievable. Name a random number between 1 and 100. Uh, 61. Okay, that's pretty random. Let's name a random number from 1 to 100. Random. 43. 43. Thank you so much. 56. 7. I want the most random number between 1 and 100. Like, most random. Um, <laughs> I know he's clearly asking a bunch of different people, but... There's not a scale of randomness in statistics, which is used heavily in nuclear engineering. I mean, perhaps colloquially, he's just referring to the highest degree of variability or unpredictability. Though I guess you could use the phrase most random, meaning every chance has an equal likelihood of occurring, because technically flipping a fair coin would be considered most random in that each side has a 50% chance, so it's all even out, but it's usually based on independence of outcomes. So this, I don't know, most random doesn't really mean anything, but I, I think I get what he's going at. Totally random. <laughs> 11. 37. 79. 79, thank you so much. 91. 7. Three. 37. 37? Why 37? I don't know, it's the first, first number that came from one. 44. 27? 37. Interesting. 4. 13. 7. 37. <laughs> really? 59. Merci. <laughs> 13. 7. Oh, that's interesting if he's doing it with multiple languages, too, that, rather than just English. 37. 37? 73. Uh, 37. 7. 35. 37. 37? No way! Back to the subject of random, I wonder if these respondents are truly random. There could be a bit of a... Uh, I don't know what his hypothesis is with this, but I know you need to be careful when doing any sort of statistical study to avoid confirmation bias. But if we didn't have a hypothesis yet, then I guess you'd have to look for more subtle things. 33. Two. 37. <gasps> I knew you were going to do it! You just 37 and walked away. Between 1 and 100. Uh, okay. 37. <laughs> Dislike icon. That's, that's my favorite number. I, I, I like that. <laughs> oh, perfect! Thank you so much! 83. Yeah, you see, given those reactions, the enthusiastic reactions by the people who are doing the survey, that's... I don't see how that isn't biased. <laughs> Even if it's retroactive, it's... I don't see how that isn't biased. 37. 37. 97. 55. 37. 37. Oh, can I shake your hand? <laughs> I love the thought you're putting into this. 37? No, you are kidding me! <laughs> and just sit and think about, wow. <laughs> are you real? Yeah, what? Did we ask you this already? Sorry? Random number between 1 to 100. 37. 37. Oh my gosh, yes! Name a random number between... Oh, uh, are they really just... Are there a bunch of other people? I'm, now I'm just wondering if they went to a bunch of other people that did not say 37. I know they showed a few clips of it. It's, I don't mean to sound overly skeptical, but it's definitely throwing up some flags right there. <laughs> One in a hundred. Uh, 37. Are you kidding me? Why? Um, it's a good number. <laughs> it's I a guess. good number. Any <laughs> number? Where did that come from? Uh, imagination, I suppose. So what's going on? Well, people are actually really bad at selecting things randomly. In fact, when asked to pick a color and a number, people reliably select blue and seven the most across dozens of different cultures. Psychologists have a name for this pattern, the blue seven phenomenon. And when picking a random number between one and a hundred- I've never heard of that at all. Blue seven, <laughs> not blue 42. It has long been suggested that the equivalent of the blue seven phenomenon is the number 37. My producer Emily and I spoke to hundreds of people to test this theory. The most common answer was 7, but maybe that's because people just expected that we'd ask them for numbers between 1 and 10. The most common two-digit number really was 37, much to our surprise. So they mentioned hundreds of people, that actually is a, is a good sample size. Say if you want 
95% confidence with a standard deviation of 30, you would only need about 140 people. That's not, that's by no means ironclad. I mean, there's some situations where you want 99% confidence, but for a colloquial thing like this, that's decent. <gasps> So we decided to embark on the biggest investigation ever on the number 37. <laughs> and it took us to some unexpected places. I think 37 is a fascinating number. It's just really interesting because it turns up so much. Is it more fascinating than 42? How many, how many objects are there here in the room with us that have a 37 on them? But I'm sure there's more than 1,000 here. I built the 37 website in 1994. Wow. I started getting email from strangers. It's everywhere. I'm trying to collect them all. We're tired. You know what? Now that he mentions it, I do remember when I look at generator output in, in, in a nuclear power plant, at least during the summertime, the number 1,337 megawatts tends to show up. I don't, or it tends to show up in my head more often, or I'll, if I see like a reactor operator taking logs or something like that, I have just seen it. Now, maybe there's something about it that's just aesthetically pleasing to a human. I know, for instance, when it comes to pricing, there's a reason why like goods are sold for like $19.99 rather than 20 bucks. Just something more pleasing about, about odd numbers. And 37, I mean, if you add it up, it, if you add the two numbers, you get 10. So maybe there's a bit of uh, interesting numerology going by, going on there that's embedded in our subconscious. I don't know. <laughs> but I do recall seeing uh, 1,337 megawatts. Then again, maybe the generator's just elite. By the way, it gets up to around 1,400 during the winter time because the main cooling reservoir gets colder, which boosts thermodynamic efficiency. So you actually make more power in the winter. Tireless. The tireless cabal of 37 people. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, people choose 37 so reliably that there's even a widespread professional magic trick that relies entirely on getting an audience member to just pick 37 out of thin air. It's called the 37 force. I'm gonna ask you to think of a number really? in a moment, okay? It's a two-digit number. It's less than 50. Both uh, numbers are odd but different. You could have 19, 17, or 15, but not 11, because you see both numbers are the same. Yeah. Okay, so he didn't mention 37 in an examples, in his examples, so not trying to skew the data. Then again, in by using it as an example, he could skew people to pick not, you know, 15 or 17 or whatever he said. Uh, I don't know if that's the best, if this magic trick's the best way of testing, because it relies on tricking people, compared to, say, a double-blind study. <laughs> one and one, next to one another. Are you ready? One, two, and three. What number did you think of? 37. 37. Fascinating. Hmm. In the famous Stanford MIT jargon file, The Origin of Hacker Slang, 37 is given as the random number of choice for computer programmers. When groups of people are. <laughs> That's a good oxymoron right there. Random number of choice. Now, I'm not a programmer. Maybe that, for those of you who are programs, Grammars that might mean something in programming, but if you're talking pure statistics there, that's an oxymoron. Old to pick a random number between one and a hundred, the most commonly chosen number is 37. Hmm. The thing is, no formal polls on this actually exist. The best we found was a Reddit poll of 1,380 people. Uh, Reddit, sure, that's your, that's your reliable source of information right there. <laughs> from four years ago. And the most popular number was, 69. But after that... <laughs> no surprises there. Yeah, that, that sounds about like Reddit. The winning number was 37. Oh. But we can do better than though, a sample size of... not by a lot. I mean, I just saw in that little graph that wasn't by a whole lot. Just a thousand people. So we conducted the largest random number survey ever. In a community post three weeks ago, we asked people to pick a random number between one and a hundred. Okay. We received 200,000 responses. Here are the results as they came in. It's fascinating to watch how consistent these supposedly C69. random numbers are. From 10,000 to 100,000, all the way up to 200,000. So, again, I was just saying about statistically significant sample sizes. The, si the sample size is smaller than what a lot of people think. You don't need... It doesn't make a difference in the context of this, like I said earlier, if it's 140 or if it's a million. It 
it kind of stays for something like this that follows a that follows this that follows this sort of distribution doesn't have any dependencies or anything like that so yeah i'm i am not surprised at all if if he if he surveyed a billion people i wouldn't be surprised if it stayed like this respondents the distribution barely changes mm -hmm. suggesting that people from all around the world think about random numbers in a particular way and this, um, granted the one bias, so this was, I saw this was on a YouTube community post, so the same sort of people that, wa that watch his videos, so, which I'd imagine is pretty diverse, I mean, this is a pretty big channel, but, yeah, whether it's 140 of his audience versus, um, uh, versus a million, 10 million, he's got 15 million subscribers, so I could, I could see him getting in a, I could see it getting into, getting well into the millions if lift the survey up for long enough. Or promoted it enough. And it is decidedly not random. Ignoring the extremes of the scale because people were primed by the numbers 1 and 100 in the question itself, and ignoring 42 and 69 because that's true because between 1 and 100, um, I've seen it inclusive versus exclusive. Because they're not random, there are. <laughs> yep, that, that's true. A few numbers that stand out, which we seem to regard Seven. as more random than the rest. 7, 73, 77, and 37. And there's something aesthetically pleasing about 7. Not entirely sure why. Then we asked people to pick the number they thought the fewest others would pick. The goal was to get rid of favorite or lucky numbers and give truly random selections. You think the fewest other people submitted interesting i'm trying to think of i'm trying to think of what that would even really change because you're still just picking a num number between one and 100. and here the results were even clearer mm. again ignoring the very extremes and 50 in the middle the most selected numbers were far and away 73 and 37. interesting i i like that the fewest one in a hundred because people are going to be confused by the between <laughs> cool which were nearly tied the actual least picked number in the first question was 90, followed by 30, 40, 70, 80, and 60. Because they got zeros in them, yes. You don't, and that's kind of a null value that people just don't really think of those as much. Yes. Multiples of 10 apparently don't seem that random. The most picked overall numbers, ignoring the outliers, were 73 and 37. Ironically, all this evidence points to 37 and its inversion, 73, as not being random at all. So why does everyone pick them? Well, one argument is that this is just how people perceive randomness. 37, does that feel random to you? Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, 50 wouldn't be random. No, no. it would be too... Um... <laughs> Biasing the question with definitions of random, even though the lay person probably doesn't use the statistician's definition of the word random. Yeah. Yeah, it's too simple. I think people think that odd, even numbers are less random than odd numbers. Five feels not random. Nine and one feel too extreme. So people tend towards three and seven. This is backed up by the fact that every one of the top hmm. numbers in our survey consisted of threes and sevens. In fact, three and seven were the most selected digits on both questions. Interesting. But there's also a mathematical case for humanity's number of choice. Because it's not just odd numbers, but specifically primes which feel like the most random numbers. Notice how we ignore odds ending in fives, mm. or how something like 39 still feels a little less random than 37. Primes feel random for at least two reasons. First, they don't appear as much in our lives. I mean, pixel counts, fruit boxes, yeah. square footage. We live in a composite world with multiple dimensions that multiply together. So we just don't see primes much past the single digits. Second, we don't have a formula for primes. If you have a prime number and you want to find the next one, you have no choice but to check every number until you find a prime. The closest thing we have to a formula is the prime number theorem, which gives the approximation that the nth prime number occurs around n times natural log of n. For example, the thousandth prime number should be around 6908, and it's close, but certainly not exact. 
Okay, and so back to 37, I guess it's, it's the 12th prime number, so maybe there's some subconscious connection about the significance of that position. I don't, I don't know. So primes essentially occur at random. But of all the primes, 30... I don't know that they're random. I mean, as the numbers get larger, there are more numbers in between each prime number. So since that's consistent, that kind of takes away the fact them from being truly random. And he already mentioned the prime number theorem, so that at least gives some stock to a level of predictability. Maybe he means something else by that statement. I don't know. Seven has reason to stand out. If we were to find the prime factors of every number, we would see that two is the smallest prime factor for exactly half of them, all of the even numbers. Sure. And three is the smallest prime factor for a sixth of all numbers, anything that's divisible by three, but not by two, and so on. As we pick larger and larger primes, they form the smallest prime factor for fewer and fewer <laughs> integers. But what if we track the second smallest prime factor of each number? Well, first we have three, which is the second prime factor of a number, only when the number is divisible by both two and three, or divisible by six. Okay. So one sixth of all numbers have a second prime factor of three. And as we keep going, which number will end up at the balancing point? This is the median second prime factor of all numbers. All numbers from one all the way up to a Google and off to infinity. Would you believe that that number is 37? <laughs> uh, you would think the one that's the first smallest prime factor would have a bit more significance than the second smallest prime factor. Um, I mean, sure. Feels like we're reaching a bit, though, when we're looking at this. Uh, I don't know. Let's take a look at five. Five is the second prime factor only when a number is divisible by five and three, but not two. Or five and two, but not three. In the first case, a number divisible by 5 and 3 means it's divisible by 15, so that's 1 15th of all numbers. But it also can't be divisible by 2, so half of 1 15th is a 30th of all numbers. Okay, I'm with In you. the second case, a number divisible by 5 and 2 means it's divisible by 10, but it cannot be divisible by 3, so we're left with right. 1 tenth times 2 thirds equals 1 15th of all numbers. Adding up these two cases, we get that one-tenth of all numbers have five as their second prime factor. And we can repeat this for the next prime, seven. Just take each of these cases and add them up to get that one-fifteenth of all integers have a second prime factor of seven. And so on. <laughs> Keeping so a running gonna, total, we quickly- You're getting 37, oh, 37 <laughs> percent. Approach a balancing point for the second prime factor across all integers. Interesting, I paused right when it said 37%. Maybe that's my subconscious looking for 37s. And then we reach it. So the median second prime factor of all numbers is 37. Half of numbers have a second prime factor of 37 or less. This reminds me of all those silly, like, Da Vinci Code style proofs from a few years ago. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not arguing that it's the second smallest prime factor. I'm just wondering if what I'm failing to see is how that's more significant than when we look at the first smallest prime factor going to the back to our the statement about the prevalence of 37. There are other remarkable qualities about 37 as a prime. It's an irregular prime, a Cuban prime, a lucky prime, a sexy prime, a permutable prime. <laughs> Okay, I haven't heard of any of those. Cuban prime, sexy prime. Padovan prime, and at this point mathematicians might just be making up types of yeah, primes. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. 37's identity as a prime number is so strong that the same day I first learned the number 37, I learned it was prime. This was one of my first books as a toddler. It teaches you every number from 1 to 100 with a short story or fun fact for each. Okay. So for 26, that's how many letters in the alphabet. Or for 30, they give the days of September. Or for 52, that's how many cards are in a deck. Except 37. It's a prime number. Nothing goes into it. Someday, you'll understand. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Maybe that's the goal of this video, just uh, make 37 most significant. It's the number that shows up everywhere for some silly reason. I'm sure a kid wouldn't think too much of it. I did not like that. <laughs> I understood every other number, so I also wanted to understand 37. So that number has nagged me ever since, and now this video is being made some 20 years later. Good motivation, remembering something that 
messed with you when you were a kid make make a video about it that's that, that's awesome Not convinced yet if you take a I number that is a multiple of 37 already like 1369 that's 37 squared and then you reverse it and then you stick a zero in between every digit then that number is a multiple of 37 huh you can do less shenanigan type stuff and say something's visible by two or ten those are those are a little bit more obvious, even numbers, numbers ending in zero. <laughs> I'm still wondering if this whole video has got a bit of confirmation bias going on. <laughs> I like the vendetta against the kids book though. That's, that's awesome. And I literally spent the next month on the bus trying to prove that fact, which I finally did. Just rattle off a six digit number. Tell me any six digit number. Uh, four, one, three, six, two, five. She didn't say a seven. Hmm. Maybe it's different for six digit numbers. And it's not, it's not divisible by 37. So how did I figure that out? Um, there's, a, there's a trick for that. Is this your like party trick that you can bring out? Surprisingly, it doesn't impress as many people <laughs> as you would think. I think it should impress everybody. That's awesome though. But there's also a practical reason 37 is an important number for humanity. Say you're faced with a choice that is both immediate and final like whether to rent the apartment you've just toured, or whether to accept a job offer you received. Or it can be as small as whether to stop at the next gas station on a road trip. Mm. These are all problems where you can't assess all the options at once, and then decide. With Is this about the numbers showing up in the price tag? With each option you encounter, you need to decide whether to accept it or reject it forever, and see what comes next. In these scenarios, it feels- Can't turn back around? I don't know. I I'm wondering how often that situation comes up. If you really want to compare shop for gas, and I guess the logic behind compare shopping for gas and, you know, turning back around, you use more gas. But I never really thought of those decisions as final, like the offer is off the table after you do that. I mean, for one, for job searching, uh, please, for those of you who are younger and applying for your first job, please, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Weigh the offers. You could even say that you have competing offers and that can potentially grease the wheel on uh, other potential job offers that are coming. So don't don't treat each job offer as final. Um, everything is up to negotiation. <laughs> Impossible to make the best choice. If you select too early, you'll probably never even see the best option. But if you select too late, hmm. well, then you've probably rejected the best option already. So your best bet is somewhere in the middle. There you know at least some information from the options you've seen, and you have some choice to select or pass. But how do you know exactly when to decide? The optimal strategy looks like this. First, you need to see some options and reject them automatically, just to learn what's out there. And then, at a certain stopping point S, you need to stop rejecting them and start evaluating whether an option is the best you've seen so far. If it is, I don't see why you would reject them. It's more of you evaluate, you say what it is, and you and you save it, though. I've never, and for stuff like gas stations, I don't know, maybe I'm in the minority here, but I've never been too picky. <laughs> My car doesn't run on any type of exotic fuel. It's not nuclear powered, as, as cool as that would actually be. Then select it. But when should that stopping point be? we need to work out which stopping point maximizes our chances of picking the best option. We can calculate these chances. For each spot, find the probability that the best option is located there, times the probability we get sure. there from stopping point S. Then add these probabilities up across every spot. Now, the chance of the best option being in any spot is just random. If there are n options in total, it's one over n. But it's a little harder to find the chances of getting to each spot. Say the best option is in the next spot after S, S plus 1. What are the chances we get there? Well, since this is the next spot over from the stopping point, we have a 100% yes. chance of getting there. So we're guaranteed to visit it and select it. But if the true best option is in spot S plus 2, well, there's a small chance we'll miss it. If the best of all the previous options is sitting in spot S plus 1, we would just pick that and stop looking before reaching S plus 2. 
there's a one in S plus one chance of this happening. So the chances we do get to spot S plus two to pick the true best option is one minus that, or- The problem is how would you necessarily know? I mean, in, in, in this thing, are you seeing what each of the best options, like these stars on these gas stations, for instance, do you know this ahead of time? And what's the assumption? I mean, I guess the assumption is you, you want the best one, not the one that's most convenient or the least amount of distance. But if you know all this ahead of time, wouldn't you just go to it? Maybe I'm missing something there. S over S plus one. This same calculation continues up until the last spot N. We only get here if we've been passing on every option so far, which means that one of the first S options must have been the best of the total N minus one options we've seen. In total, this gives us the expression one over N times one plus S S over S plus one plus S over S plus two, and so on all the way up to S over N minus one. Factoring out the S, the sum inside the parentheses approximates the function one over X going from S to N. Okay. All right. I, I think I'm with him now. I got, I got a bit confused. <laughs> all right. Yeah. It's just your, your standard function because you know, there's only there's only so many options, and as you get more and more, the, the probability would go down as methodically for sufficiently high n. Okay. Taking that integral, we get the natural log of n over yep. s. So the probability we select the best option is s over n times the natural log of n over s. Basically a review of calculus one. <laughs> To maximize this probability, we can find the peak of this function by setting its derivative to zero. And this gives the natural log of s over n equals negative one. So s over n equals one over e, or about 37%. <laughs> one over e being 37%. Uh, gotta love these little tricks he's doing to make 37 show up more often. So explore and reject 37% of options just to get a sense of what's out there. And then, Pick the first option to come along that's better than all of the ones you've seen so far. And your chances of success using this method are also... 37%? 37%. That's so weird. Now, so this doesn't really come up com compared to the uh, Pareto 80-20 um, principle. That is to say, 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. You see this in business for identifying the most successful products, really promote the top 20% and rationalize the bottom 20% for that matter. You see it in risk management, even for, for things like evaluating risk in a nuclear power plant, though there are some requirements that have to uh, delve a little bit further than the 80% solution, which those marginal costs of addressing those risks above that can get pretty crazy. Like Fukushima, for instance, ultra extreme example, but um, we ended up bringing in additional backups for the many stream already existing streams of backup systems we had at our nuclear power plant in order to help mitigate the effects of that type of event. And when I say that type of event, I'm referring to an extended loss of power, not specifically a tsunami, but other natural disasters that cause an extended loss of AC power. So additional generators, um, coordination with remote sites to bring in more generators if the entire site gets affected by some sort of natural disaster, that sort of thing. But 3737, I've never seen it come up. I've never even heard of it. This math question is known as the secretary problem or the marriage problem, as it also applies to hiring the best employees or even deciding on the best life partner. Now it can be impractical to check 37% of the options because you don't always know how many candidates are out there. But the 37% rule also works for time. So if you wanna get married, say in 10 years, then spend the first 3.7 years seeing what's out there and then select the next person who's better than anyone you've seen. Not at all the approach I used for, uh, for finding my wife. I've never applied this rule at anything, it's just... So 37 is actually important to our lives, and people seem to subconsciously recognize this. We gravitate towards the number everywhere.
I just think it's an a pleasing number. I mean, right there for a, for a price, 37 um, odd numbers. So I could see it better. I could see more people buying it for 37 cents than for 36 cents. That in 36 seems like a, because it's a much more of an ordinal number, you know, 12 times three being 36. It's, uh, I definitely know that's one component to uh, psychological pricing. But yeah, maybe we just gravitate to it. 37 seconds. 37 years. 37 pounds? I was 37. 37 Take cubic 37. feet. 37. 37. How many enemies do you have? All this right here seems like it's ripe with confirmation bias. I mean, you're showing like the mile marker, for instance. I mean, you literally have those every mile for those of you who don't live in the U.S. seeing all those mile markers on, uh, on interstates. And random clips from uh, TV. I'm sure people list hundreds, thousands other numbers just as often, but it's, uh, it, it is kind of funny. 37. 37! 37 percent. 37. 37 hours. 37. Destroyed 37 restaurants. 37? Oh, 37. 37 interlocking bronze gears. Page 37. 37 years old. 37. <laughs> now he's putting it on his own videos. That's, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> Seven prototypes. 37 percent. This collection of images, everything you're seeing on screen has been collected by one man over the course of his life. And you already know who it is. It's just fun, right? <laughs> the whole thing is just fun. How many, how many objects are there here this is in silly. the room with us that have a 37 on them? Uh, this is probably on the order of uh, four. You didn't get 37 of them, or maybe he got 37 times 37 of those objects? <laughs> Digits, I'd say. Um, there's probably not 10,000, but I'm sure there's more than 1,000 here. Neutral grain. 37 uh, times 37, bars, do it. 37 grams. It's a 37 inch yardstick. It's just some political cartoon about sports, but th there's no reason that guy had to have jersey number 37. A nail that I found somewhere that has 37 on the head, I don't even know what that means. One time, my mom gave me $37 for my birthday. They all. What? <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe it's some. I don't know how old he was for that for that birthday, but some something that happened when he was younger that he ended up just uh, having that fixation, like that one woman in that kid's book for but that didn't offer a very satisfactory explanation of what thirty-seven was. I'll have thirty-seven in the serial number. Was your thirty-seventh birthday like the greatest birthday ever? I had a big party and I invited everybody I knew. <laughs> the Texas State Lottery was thirty-seven million dollars, so I had two different friends wow. who both gave me 37 lottery tickets. I didn't win, I won five bucks. This is an article from when they- You didn't win 37 bucks? Come on. Found the 37th Mersenne Prime. It's just clipping after clipping. How many, how many hundreds of these do you want me to go through? I must have gotten that in Germany, but I don't know, but I don't remember what it was. Was it like a locker number? I wouldn't steal a locker number. I've never stolen for 37. <laughs> Look at that. On the highway, yeah. when I was on a road trip. I heard I you have, say you've never I stolen I have anything. committed a crime. Yeah. Wow. There was a, a bookstore on campus when I was an undergrad at, at KU, and there were 37 steps in that staircase. Useful facts. These are useful facts. I mean, if you're, if you're the guy that's going to be looking for 37 everywhere, you're going to find it. It's kind of like that, that bias that gets in as soon as you buy a new car, you're going to start seeing that car everywhere. And that's because your brain is subconsciously looking for the car, so you're going to see it everywhere, just like with 37. Do you feel like everyone gets 37 this much in their lives, or do you feel like you're just attracting Just 37 it? times? That's a good question. You know, the reason I started was because it seemed like it turned up a lot. I started back in the 80s. There was a comedy routine by Charles Fleischer, and he went through this sort of litany of coincidences about the number 37, like there are 37 holes in the speaker part of a telephone. Shakespeare wrote 37 plays, there's 37 movements in base. This whole thing is the first time I've heard the significance of 37. I mean, I know about significance of like the number three or the number nine, or certain shapes like, like the pyramid, but 37, this is <laughs> interesting. I mean, I, I, I almost feel like you could do this for just about any number, though. Just whatever your favorite number is, you could draw a bunch of, a bunch of connections to it. Beethoven's Nine Symphonies. There are all these amazing coincidences that he rattled off. Mm -hmm. I was amazed, and I've been collecting them ever since. Since like 1981. Uh, yeah, so 43, 43 years probably. 
I built the 37 37 website for the first time in 1994. I don't know how the website got out there, but it, but somehow it got out there. Uh, I started getting email from strangers. I've got oh, maybe a half a dozen people from around the world who every week or month will post um, the, their latest batch of 37s that they've seen out and about. And they've been doing this for how long? Uh, 18. I wonder if after this video, 37's no longer going to be a random number. It's going to end up like 42 or 69, where it's more memetic than what it initially was. I wonder if that's the whole purpose behind this video. Years. Wow. We're tireless. The tireless cabal of 37 people. Yeah. Do you have anything to say to anyone who might be like, 37, that's just a base 10 representation of that number. I am also interested in the number 37 in all- That's true. I never, I never thought of that. All of its various other forms, Roman numerals, binary numbers, yeah. 100101, by the way, um, it, yeah, numbers in any other base. Binary's fun. Yeah, yeah. 25 uh, in hexadecimal, 4 5 in octal. Do you think you're going to keep looking for a 37 and collecting 37 for your whole life? This yeah. is so nerdy yeah, and I love it. reason to stop. Yeah, for sure. So maybe there's even something innately, universally special about this number. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's good. Back to this one. That 37 degrees is an approximation. If you take it out a couple more significant digits, it's 36.87 degrees. There, there's a bit of reaching going on here. We can argue special coincidences for many numbers, but we need to finally address the elephant in the room. Yeah, okay, here we the go. The sheer amount of brain power 37 secretly takes up in our collective minds. It's humanity's go-to random number, one of our most prominent prime numbers, and- Which thereby makes it not random. Most of all, our ideal number for making decisions. Maybe that's why we're inclined to it naturally. It feels right to us as where to settle and what to pick, Though with this video, we may have ruined randomness even further. I mean, the next time yes. anyone asks people to pick a random number between one and 100, more people than ever might be saying 37. Thank you for acknowledging that, yes. Also, why isn't this video 37 minutes long? Or 37 minutes and 37 seconds? It's been the story of my life that I intend to take everything that I have here and turn them all into individual facts on that website. Uh, but the website's been there untouched for 27 years and it hasn't happened. It doesn't look like it's ever gonna happen. Maybe on the 37th anniversary, we can get it all done. Yeah. That's a good idea. Then by 2037. That's a good idea. I, I, Cause I have time to do it between now and then. Uh, and that would be- 2031. Would be, that's, that's a great idea. <laughs> Once our video comes out, do you want people to write you with any instances they see of 37? You might get swamped for a little bit. 37 is out there. It's everywhere. I'm trying to collect awesome. them all. Bring it. Yes, bring it. I don't know about this one. I, I really don't. I, I still think we got cases of coincidences, confirmation bias, and even the test. I, I question whether or not their survey was really unbiased. I mean, they clearly reacted. The surveyors reacted to the mentioning of the number 37 when the, uh, the people surveyed mention it. So it wasn't a blind test. It would appear, I don't know if they, if their hypotheses were actually registered or not, or if they just saw the 37s and brought them up. It's possible it was pre-registered because they might have known about the 37 website guy. I don't know if the, the respondents were really, were really random. I don't know if they did any sensitivity analysis at all. Again, I'm just not 100% sure. But maybe there's something out there that, that I'm missing about 37 specifically, but it really seems like you could do this with a lot of numbers. Either way, really enjoyed the video. I thought this was one of the more entertaining Veritasium ones I've seen in a while. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.